So in terms of transitioning into some of the community solutions that are percolating, um, our local immune system to, um, we call it BAST fibers and BAST fiber blends solutions to pollution panel. And I'm gonna have each one of these panelists introduce themselves. And I will start with, um, hmm. Yeah, maybe you could jump to, oh, there we go, Mary. So, Mary, if it's okay, I'm gonna let you go through this, if you'd like. Have Aaron do it. Perfect. <laughs> A little louder. Like this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, my name is Mary Woods, and um, I found my way to this whole arena of uh, fiber and natural dyes, uh, actually in Forestville. I went to the California School of Herbal Studies, and that's where I first met Rebecca and took my first natural dye class. Um, I started, after I, I uh, finished school at the California School of Herbal Studies, I uh, started, I got really into uh, plant spirit medicine, so I started studying with a lot of different teachers and really connecting with the energetics of plants. Um, that brought me to many different places in the world where I studied um, with uh, plant medicine people from South America, uh, Native American tribes, and Hawaii. And in all of these cultures, I came across this idea of actually wearing your clothing as medicine. And I was really taken with this idea. So. Um, the closest, when I, when I first started learning about this, I was like, is that a thing? You know, is that, it, it's kind of crazy, like, why isn't nobody doing this? And what I was also finding as a clinical herbalist is that it was really hard um, to get somebody to change their diet or just to drink tea three times a day or take a tincture. I was like, wouldn't that be cool if there's just something that you could give them that would help, you know, facilitate their healing and support their health? Um, instead of just like making them do this whole protocol that most people kind of dropped out of after a, f a few weeks, which is really, you know, it's like you put your heart and soul into help that you wanted to help somebody and you can give them all the information um, that you have and unless they're willing to kind of make those changes themselves. So I was like, okay, uh, wearable medicine, this is a great idea. <laughs> so I started doing research and found that the closest thing I can speak about in terms of um, scientifically proven uh, aspects of this idea is from the Indian culture of Ayurveda, so they call it um, Oravastra, which means healing cloth, and uh, you know, however many thousands of year, years ago in India, if you had uh, ailments that were similar to arthritis, they may have dyed your, your tunic in turmeric, and that would be your prescription. So uh, when, I, when I looked into this, basically we absorb up to 65% of what we put on our skin. Um, that includes the fabrics and the dyes that are being used in the fashion industry currently. And when I, when I realized, you know, not just the energetic of the plants and the medicine that were coming in from the dyes and the, the fiber, um, but that there was like a, a more, uh, I would say like conventional reason to wear your medicine, <laughs> then I was like, wow, this is really cool. So I found, actually I should say nettle found me I had no idea that people actually made uh, material out of nettle fiber, and um, it was actually uh, the nettle plant that came to me, and uh, and so I started researching where are these where is nettle fiber. So I found that there was a history of in Scotland, mostly in Europe, that people had made nettle clothing, and it was really cool. I think Napoleon actually made his soldiers' uniforms out of nettle and they've done some tests with Formula One racing and all of the jackets and that kind of thing. But where I actually found that they're still making nettle fiber is in the eastern part of the Himalayas. So I uh, ventured there in 2014 and immersed myself in a community called um, Sankasaba, and it's in the eastern part of the Himalayas. Uh, you can fly into a place called Kanbari, which is where people fly in to hike Mount Everest, and from there it's about a three-day trek on foot. So there I learned um, the 14 steps of nettle processing, and they're using a type of plant called Giridinia diversifolia, and I was unsure whether or not it was an urtica, and then I went and um, talked with one of my mentors, David Hoffman, who is a, works at Traditional Medicinals, and he's one of, the, one of the original green grandfathers, I would say, of herbalism, and I've learned so much from him, but he said, no, 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 you know, 
it is Antarctica. Basically, it just got some, somewhere in the Latin name. It got diverted and all of this thing. So it is a different Latin name, but it is an Urtica, Urticaceae family. And um, so back to this idea of wearing your medicine uh, energetically when plants fibers are. This is what I've come to understand from these different ancient cultures that I've studied with and. Um, that I feel myself to be true. I've um, become extremely sensitive. Uh, th that's kind of how I was born, I would say. I was always the canary in my family where if you know, there was a chemical floating around the house, I was the first one to get hives. Or like, My mom could never use regular detergent because I would break out in hives. And so I grew up being extremely sensitive to all of these different things. So I've always had like, a lot of empath empath or empathy for um, people that are just really sensitive. And... So energetically, nettle, um, also when you're taking it internally, it's kind of like this very fortifying plant, and so that's also happening energetically. So what I found is I also have other people that are into um, plant spirits and more of energetic, like more esoteric aspects of fibers, where the nettle um, helps them if they're out in cities or they're in airports, so there's a way where they feel ungrounded and kind of just overwhelmed by crowds, that the nettle fiber actually helps um, make them helps ground them and feel protected from energetics and so this is also in uh, alignment with a lot of the wisdom that I learned from a lot of the elders that I studied with that this is actual real thing so in Hawaii they use kapa cloth which is uh, a particular um, bark or fabric that they make from bark um, in Nepal they're using nettle uh, and in different parts of they're using different plants in different parts of the world depending on what, where it is growing um, where, the, where these cultures are located um, for this purpose. So anyways, um, I have been working with this co collective for uh, four years now. I go, I uh, try to go once a year, if not every two years, and um, I find out about the needs that they have in the community. I'm really trying to create a revenue stream for them because there is fungus coming here from China destroying their lychee crops, which means that this is the only way that they can really make a living right now. And uh, encouraging them to continue their, um, their process with uh, clay and natural materials to, to um, process and harvest this fiber. So if you have any questions, I'll be over here in the corner. And I have lots of examples. And thank you. So um, Mary Pettis Sarley, who is um, also on the board of Fiber Shed, will be presenting next. And she is from the Carneros region of Napa. And we don't have slides for Mary, but um, I don't think we do. No, no. OK. You're just going to tell your story. All right. We're not going to move slides. Go for it. <laughs> um, I've been working with John Lithian and Rebecca for the last three years with uh, integrating hemp and however it comes in form with my wool blends. Um, at first, I, I didn't know where it would take me. At this point, it's taken me to try to develop a heel and toe yarn for socks that's not synthetic based anymore, but it's strong because of the addition of the bast fiber and then you get cushioning through and cushioning and wicking through the, the wool blended with it and I use um, alpaca wool and mohair which is my normal blend and um, it's taking me on this incredible journey with John uh, and all the testing from cottonized hemp which becomes more of a decorative element through a structural integration um, of the hemp, and I think all bass fibers would be applicable to um, this process. And um, it's it's been an adventure that's been fabulous for me, just in all the places that it's taken me. And just to uh, point out, Mary, when she says a mohair and wool blend, those are her animals, and the alpaca is all from her ranch. And um, twirl yarns aren't here today because they smelled of smoke. And um, just glad you're with us. Yeah. 
and Lydia. Do you want me to do your slides? Um, I think I can do. And this is Lydia Went, who has been um, who I met at Mary's Ranch uh, for a mushroom dye workshop, and she offered to donate time to knit structure development program that we were doing at the time with a brand and. Um, I, she didn't know what she was getting into. She is an incredible genius knit structure uh, designer, and we were so blessed to have her in the community because she's really advancing the technical side of the work that's being grown out of these lands. So, thank you, Lydia. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, is this, all right, it's on. Uh, okay, so that is my company, California Cloth Foundry, and what Rebecca didn't say was that I founded my company as the commercial vehicle for the North Face Backyard Project that Rebecca brought to me. So it was a fantastic, um, amazing experience, a whole year, year and a half of development. And um, from there, I, number one, am a commercial um, apparel and textile designer. So. Um, first off, I'm really honored to be on this panel of innovators because I come from um, reverse engineering products so that they can be commercially viable for the general um, consumer. And so I set off um, after the backyard project um, for Rebecca and the North Face to create um, a garment. Well, actually our backyard hoodie was good enough to eat. So going back to Rachel and her um, first slide where she said that we are eating our clothing, um, I do realize that um, probably after a whole year working with Rebecca, um, I, re I thought, well, the solution is to create um, clothing that is good enough to eat. And that means that you can actually water your gardens with your uh, effluents of your washing machines and your, your home use and your gray water. So I'll try to move quickly. Um, one little provocative slide. I work with a, um, this is a food partner of mine, and they are the Alchemist Kitchen. And their goal is to educate and to create um, food healing from the inside out. So all of their plant-based food is, is um, they create meals and work with in a, food innovators to heal as I said, from the inside out, and as Mary is working on healing from the outside in, that's actually um, our stake in the ground as well. That's our, that's our motto is we, you know, we want to create um, apparel and textiles, textiles for our, our small brands that are, are working with us, but apparel as well that is healing from the outside in. Um, no one of these is going to work. There we go. That's just, that's the, uh, the model that I grew up in, in New York City. Um, obviously, this is contemporary fast fashion, but I was a contributor to the, the movement into fast fashion over the last 20 years of apparel and textile design. And obviously, the, the food is an easy, provocative image. Um, some of the brands that I work with, so um, in New York, what I, um, when I was working in private label, especially with Bloomingdale's and the limited stores, I was negotiating pennies out of my vendors' um, pockets, which um, I actually thought was a feather in my cap because I was creating um, higher margins for my clients like Bloomingdale's and the limited stores. What I didn't realize is I was negotiating mar um, pennies out of the labor and the farmers' pockets. And once I did finally realize that about 10 years ago, I moved into um, sustainable textiles. I went down the supply chain to learn a little bit more about how to change that. So. <laughs> the fruition or the, the pinnacle um, product that is, you know, shows that it can actually be a commercially viable um, possibility. And these are some of the clients that um, um, California Cloth Foundries textiles are um, being sold to right now. And so the, the goal of working um, with the entire industry, um, moving textiles into um, more conventional supply chains is to refashion the industry from the fiber all the way to the fashion. And I think that's about it. Okay, so this, this is the supply chain. Um, 
that's, you know, obviously if you're taking organic cotton, I'm using, I'm actually wearing sustainable cotton projects, um, cleaner cotton from the Central Valley of California, all naturally dyed, um, no toxins added. Um, that um, Shepherd Fairy image in the middle, no petrochemicals whatsoever um, in my supply chain. Obviously, petrochemicals are fueling the supply chain, but we don't add from our fiber all the way to our fashion any chemistry um, that has um, any fiber or chemistry that would be petro-based, crude oil based. Um, next one, oops, let's get to scale. I truly believe that, um, one minute, okay, great. <laughs> I'm pretty much done, but um, it was mentioned that if you're making heirloom quality products, that that can be, um, those, that apparel can be consignment, sold, resold, that's a, that's a very important um, aspect, I think, of, of um, re-educating our industry. Uh, natural dyes, vertical farming, there's a lot of innovation going on, so um, I'd rather leave that to the innovators to talk about. And I think that's essentially it, um, triple bottom line for people, planet, and profits. Just let's do it naturally. Hmm. And our next speaker um, actually is Sandy Fisher. And so the <laughs> yep. And Sandy is working on a bast fiber project in the Foothill region in the Chico region and she will tell you more about that now. And Erin can help you if it doesn't work. <laughs> we're, called, we're calling ourselves Chico Flats. Um, it's really become a community project. Um, it's, it, we want to make, take our flax, grow it into linen, or make linen, um, and have a mill. There are no linen mills in America right now. So we are under doing a big, big project. I'm a weaver. I want the finished product. So. Can we do this together? <laughs> we can help. Okay. okay sorry. Uh, um, we have discovered that we can grow flax in the winter. It likes cool weather. I live in Chico. Chico, it's very hot. So a couple of uh, years ago, in my backyard, my husband said, "Hey, I think we can grow this around Thanksgiving. I'm going to plant it at Thanksgiving." So we sure enough did, and it thrived. It got through the first frost. It likes frost, I found out. And the other thing in my research as a non, just a hobby gardener, having I mean, to figure out this industry that I'm creating, um, that it, within seven years, flax adapts to its environment. So we are going to have a Chico winter crop. We've been doing this for five years. So um, we're very, very excited. So we are growing flax as a winter crop. And I'll tell you the words out, and people are excited. I did a symposium in the East Coast. That's unheard of there. It's always been a spring crop. So anyway, that's been our first most discovery. Um, we've grown in a couple of small gardens. We are very, very small. Um, and uh, we've tried different times of the year again. But again, winter is where we're doing it. We can grow it in um, uh, planting excuse me, in November, December. We're actually harvesting in um, uh, April. Um, we're really excited right now is that the University, Chico State University, will be growing experimental plots. We have about uh, five varieties coming from uh, France and the Netherlands. We've got them, they're en route to us, so um, we can get to that perfect uh, winter crop quality. I'm looking for quality, and that's our goal. So, um, one of the things that's very challenging is the uh, planting is easy, but harvesting, um, it has to be drawn from the, um, the whole plant. We have to pull it by hand manually. Um, there are a couple pictures of us showing it. Um, it's a great community gathering, but it's not very practical on a big scale. In Europe, they have special harvesters that are like um, teeth that grab this root uh, from the root and they put it on the ground. Um, and of course, these are just some fun pictures we've done of that. Um, we have been successful in kind of very casually uh, measuring our volume because people ask me that. Um, and now with the college coming on board, we're going to have a little more accuracy on that. 
Um, uh, the tools, uh, you know, our tools have been very primitive. In fact, the tools we'll be demonstrating on are advanced hand tools, we're proud to say. Um, we had some really almost toys we were called, but we were actually processing. Um, uh, but we are excited, again, our connection with the university, we have the engineering department on board. My vision is, okay, we've got hand tools, let's do the next step of semi-automated bicycle powered. So that's our next goal. So. Um, Redding um, is a, an issue. Um, you know, the winter crop, we're, we're not relying on water or pesticides. Redding does take water. So um, there's two aspects we're using. Um, it commercially, you know, it's that, uh, well, the, you do redding, water redding, and just skip the uh, chemical redding, we're not even going there. It's just, I listed that because that's the way it is. Um, uh, the first one we've explored, explored with and had some success is dew redding. We don't get dew, we're in the valley, it gets hot. So we've got this artificial, artificial dew redding technique where we've um, applied some misters um, in the middle of the night that goes on a timer, and it's been working. And uh, low uh, water impact, I'm, I'm, I'm not a sprinkler person, but it, it uh, doesn't take a lot of water. Um, that's, so that's one of our, our successes that we're delighted, along with our winter crop. Um, the other one we've tried is, the, on a very small scale, is the water redding. Um, and that's been a success because we've got the heat, so it speeds up the process. Um, again, that does use more water. But um, we can, in that 100 gallon tank there, there's about 60 pounds of fiber. So um, on our smart scale, that, that works. So um, we'll be demonstrating all these. I, I like the, the words in it. So we've got redding, we're going to break. And I'll run through these rather quickly um, because we'll be doing them. Um, the enthusiasm, of, as you can see this, our small primitive break. We've got the big break out there. Um, and the community aspect has been a, a really great, fun gathering. Um, and this is a, well, that's okay, that's all right. I'll go on, I don't want to take more time talking about well, that. That's a possibility of one that we could add um, uh, a power to, a bicycle power, a brake. Mm -hmm. Sketchy, that's the next step. Um, and it's a paddle, again. You know, we're doing the colonial thing here, you know, and, 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 and I, like, my goal is to get this done. And it, my frustration has been, you know, this is long, a long time for me to produce. And when Rebecca asked us to join Fiber Shed, I go, I'm not a producer, you know, and, and, and so, so this is my next goal. We, you know, we've got a winter crop, we've got the dew redding, and now we want a mill. And um, there's a group in Nova Scotia that is actually through uh, Canada, they've gotten a grant. And we are um, partnering with them to get those mills over here. So um, I'm not even going to get through the pictures, but we'll just kind of run through my minutes up almost. <laughs> um, but um, <coughs> happily is the next stage, stage where you get this beautiful foam. Oh, nice. And um, we have our spinner here. And she'll be demonstrating. And of course, flax is not linen until it's spun. So we actually have a picture of our first skein that we did a couple years ago. And we invite you to come over and, and give it a whirl if you want. And of course our goal is to have uh, cottage industries like myself. I've been a weaver for 30 years producing this wonderful local source. Organically grown, uh, recyclable material. Thank you, Sandy. And we're going to hear from John Lupian, who is working with hemp processing at a different scale. And he is visiting us from Nebraska. And I'm so glad you're here, John. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I'm John Lupian. I'm with BASCOR. We're out of uh, Omaha, Nebraska. And what we're doing is we're developing technology to process hemp, and we have to kind of take a totally new approach to doing that because the old ways of fast fiber processing just won't work here at an industrial scale. So um, I'm not sure what we have here. Do uh, you want to go ahead and? Oh, movie next? Do you want to use that as yeah, well? Yeah, okay. I'm going to, uh, we're going to show a short video. It's two minutes, and it's, um, it's an open house we just had about a month ago, so you'll see a lot of stuff that I'll be talking about.
for sitting through that. Um, so what you saw there was our, our facility and where we're at right now with processing. And um, essentially with that, what we do there is we decorticate the hemp and we refine the fiber. So there were pictures of our decorticator, um, some fiber cleaning equipment that's attached to the back of it, and um, also a fiber opener. And to process hemp into a textile grade fiber, unless it's real, real, uh, really well redded, um, you typically need to wet process it. So um, some of the pictures in there were wet processed hemp as well that's been opened up. And uh, we didn't show any of those pictures. But essentially, in order to do this in a sustainable manner, we have to totally reinvent how we're doing it. Because right now, it's what's coming out of China is not sustainable. Um, so. We currently use a, a system that uses alkali, so we're not totally sustainable right now, but we're moving rapidly towards being sustainable and having a closed loop system. Um, I, I could talk on and on and on about all this stuff, but it's really, it's a, the challenge is a supply chain. We have to work backwards to the farmers. Right now, people are not growing it as a fiber crop, they're growing it as a seed crop or as a CBD crop. And some people are actually innovating in doing CBD and seed. So we have to take fiber from those type of crops and, util and be able to turn it into a textile grade fiber. That's one of the challenges. It's not easy. Um, but we also have to go up the, uh, down the supply chain to the spinners like Mary and work with them as well to make sure that our fiber meets their specs. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to bring this fiber to market. But I think uh, we got a good start. Um, we've relied on uh, investment to this point, and we've, we've been blessed to have great angel investors and uh, seed investors who've guided the company along. Um, and we're just really excited about what the future holds. And uh, you know, having a group like Fiber Shed and like-minded people here is excellent. Ultimately, what hemp processing what we're doing about is is about sustainable materials. Um, and so the fiber is roughly 20% of the plant, and the wood is another 80% of the plant. And um, I got excited while uh, Rachel was talking. I mean, the, the ball she made, we could, we could make that as a biocomposite out of our hemp wood. Or, uh, <laughs> talk to you later. Um, but we're also, and another thing she mentioned too is a new way of doing synthetic fibers. We're actually working on that right now with our, with our wood in a closed loop process to make um, what's a uh, regenerated cellulose. It's like rayon, but not uh, the effluent problem is, is eliminated. So it's a, a unique new fiber that we're developing from the wood. But the main thing that we're doing is we're trying to cottonize the fiber and turn it into a staple link that works with wool and with cotton. Do I have time after? I go, oh, all right, I'll continue talking. <laughs> so, you know, what the real challenge for us has been is opening the fiber after wet processing. And um, what happens with hemp after you wet process it and it dries down is it clumps together. And so we've had to innovate on that as well. We've developed a new machine for that. Um, we're in the process right now of adding a metering and alignment system to our feed table so we can handle the, uh, the way that these stocks come in are in these big square bales. And the material is just a tangled mess. So we've developed something to take that and align the material going into the decorticator so that we can retain as much fiber length as possible. And uh, part of our decorticator actually opens up the fiber as well. So we're doing a couple things in the, the machine itself. Whereas uh, in older technology, it would take several different machines we can run through in one, one shot with our machine. And uh, of course, we've developed a bail opener that would come next. And we've even gone further and developed another piece of equipment for uh, cleaning the fiber after the uh, decorticator based on our observation of how the, the big piece you saw that was up in the, uh, up in the air, that's an old uh, piece of cotton ginning equipment that we're using right now. And we've developed something based on that and some older cotton ginning technology. So, um, well, I've been given one more minute here, so I think I'll, I'll probably just wrap up here because I know we have a lot of questions and um, answer section. But this is exciting. I'm happy to be here. And uh, thank you. Mm -hmm.
And just to answer to the question of scale that actually Rachel brought up earlier, I'm just going to do a brief thought exercise before we go to the questions. In the United States in 2015, farmers grew 56 million acres of winter wheat, most of which was grown in these cooler months, which leaves the possibility open for rotating with a summer hemp crop or other, cotton as well. Sally does cotton and wheat in her farming uh, rotations. But if you were to look at just rotating hemp and wheat, um, if we were to conduct a thought exercise focused upon assessing what it would look like to add hemp into the wheat cycle within the US, we could assume yields of an additional 112 million tons of hemp fiber flowing into our US-based US textile system. If we assume a yield of two tons of fiber per acre, if these same croplands were integrated with fiber producing livestock, sheep and goats, to graze and clear the fields and cycle nutrients and support the ability for the farmer to be able to plant the next crop using conservation tillage strategies, this would support known soil health enhancing practices um, while adding an additional 950,000 tons of millable protein fiber into the fiber system based on low stocking rates of seven wool producing animals to the acre. The 950,000 pounds of wool assumes 50% of the wool would be lost in processing. It could be fairly and easily assumed that this integrated agricultural system of wheat, hemp, and protein fiber producing animals would healthfully yield these materials, including lamb and dairy, and could generate an additional 113 million tons of natural fiber per year in this country alone without converting any additional land to agriculture. That would equate to approximately enough fiber to produce 23 billion one pound garments, assuming all the weight losses throughout the milling supply chain. Nationally speaking, we don't even consume that many garments per year which in turn means that we would have ample room within this scenario to reduce the acreage planted with hemp significantly and still produce enough natural fiber to clothe everyone in the country with compostable and natural fiber garments. Um, so that's that. Um, and then <laughs> I had to write a book earlier this year, so that's where that came from. Um, <laughs> so let's go to, um, to Mary. Um, I'd love to have you describe some of the physical realities um, of nettle processing, just because we've, we've heard the word decortication and we've heard the term degumming. If in that definition of or showing and sharing the hand processing that you've experienced, maybe unpack the language a little too. Okay, so... Um what they, so there's a 14-step a process that I discussed, and also I have a video of that process at my table if you guys want to see that, um, of the villagers doing that. But I would say that the challenges are just the remote location and um, getting the fiber from uh, con from this, this village to a place where they can really sh ship it out and get it to the consumers. But what they do is... Uh, Instead of breading, they are putting it into with wood ash and cooking it over a fire. And then um, from that process, they then, I don't know if we have, yes, I think this is, this is the, oh, they're rinsing it off out here. Um, so with the wood ash, and they're cooking over the fire, and then they um, are uh, coating it in this type of clay that they get from the river. And I think this is, this is what they say helps um, keep the fibers from sticking together or binding back together. But I think it's also something that softens the fiber as well. So there is a bit of a language barrier. And I think also their understanding of what is happening um, isn't quite the full picture of what's happening. Um, but with a couple of people I've spoken to here in terms of like hemp processing and flax processing, it seems to be that they're using this particular clay that I believe has a lot of calcium in it um, to help the fibers from clumping back together and then also it would help them um, separate it. So what they do after the clay is dried, they actually um, beat it out with, uh, they're kind of like little clubs, I don't know how to explain it, um, and then they separate it out, they actually put the whole um, skiing around their toe and then they separate it out softly. So they're, so they're not doing anything with the machine that would actually like, harm the integrity of the, the fiber. Um, and so it keeps that intact, whereas when you're doing it with a machine, you have to be really careful um, because sometimes the machine, the tensioning, or my, my understanding is, you know, it'll break apart the fibers. Um, 
this, this type of Urtica species is, I think the longest fiber I've seen um, was about 65 centimeters. Um, so that's actually, uh, they, they say it's the strongest bass fiber in the world um, because of the length of it basically. So this type of Urtica species is growing um, 20 to 30 feet in the jungle. And um, yeah, it's, it's a huge, you don't want to get stung with that. <laughs> it happened to my aunt when she was actually filming the whole process, poor thing. But, yeah. Um, and so, John, a um, question for you on that. Do you want to describe then decortication also and degumming in your process a little bit more? Yeah, sure. Uh, decortication is simply the process of removing the oh. fast fiber in... It's volume. Oh, okay. <laughs> is it not working? It's not you could use maybe it's Lydia's. It's not yeah. closer to it. Closer? closer? Right to your mouth. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. So decortication is uh, the removal of the bast fiber, which is essentially bark. It's the German word for bark. So it's the removal of the outer bast fiber from the inner core wood. And the core wood is referred to as herd and hemp and shive and, or shiv and flax and probably the same case with nettles. Uh, they're all they're all in that class of plants. So the fiber that we're all talking about right now is the bast fiber, and it occurs in these bundles that um, hold little tiny fibers in them actually and they run the whole length of the stalk well, up through the bark. So that's the cortication. And you asked about degumming? Yeah, a little and bit about degumming. The degumming is essentially the, the bast fibers when they're in the bundles, they're, ho they're held together by gums. And these gums are the lignans uh, and uh, sugars, uh, they're called pectin and xylan and stuff like that. They're C5 sugars, carbon 5 sugars. And these things bind up with the cellulose and form the uh, fiber bundles. And to get to those individual cellulose fibers, you have to remove a degree of those gums, and that's the trick. If you remove all of them, the fibers get too short. Um, but when you remove the right amount, you get very, very nice fibers. So that can be done a number of different ways. Um, like Mary was just saying, uh, that, you, that clay is probably calcium carbonate. It's an alkali. That uh, helps remove the gums. Um, acid can be used, but acid can actually attack the fiber, so that's not a good one. Um, and uh, there's, there's a whole number of different ways. And redding is the traditional way, which is simply just allowing biological processes to act on the fiber. Um, and those eat up the gums. But those can also go too far and start attacking the fiber as well. So it's a, it's a tricky process. And uh, it's also an area where we need to have innovation and it's something we're working on because we need to get a more sustainable way to do that so that there's not effluent and pollution problems. Thank you. And Mary, could you describe some of the properties you're starting to see given that there's decortication and degumming and, oh, I'm sorry, Mary Pettis. Sorry. I went to Mary P. Some of the properties you're seeing as we blend the proteins and the plants together, um, the cellulose and the protein, what are the properties in the yarn that you're enjoying um, observing in these blends um, that you could speak to a little bit? So, so in the actual yarn after it's, John's had his way, his way with it, um, <laughs> it, what it's adding to the protein fiber is a drape strength um, and then my protein part adds a luster also strength I use long wolves which are more similar in structure and, and fiber length to what John's making so that they integrate um, and I get a, a super strong fiber um, one of the qualities when you get into the the consideration of socks is that it, one of the side benefits for me is that it stimulates your circulation as well. And so you're getting like all these, like healing from the inside out, so you're getting all these cross benefits from the combination which are super exciting for me. So you're get the mohair is offering strength, I mean traditionally the best Cinches for horses were made out of mohair because it's strong. So that is that element it's adding. The, the um, alpaca fiber is adding some loft 
so that you have a little more cushioning. If you do, you can play around with any, any blend. Uh, if you just do alpaca and bass, you have a softer fiber because the alpaca is coming to the outside and that's what you're feeling, but it will be stronger. And so they're just all these different plays. The, uh, the, the wool that I use from Long Wools has a bold crimp, it has a luster, it has a grape, and it more, has more commonality with the bast fiber than, say, a high crimp soft yarn. You just end up with a different end result. Hmm. Thank you. I, I had a question yeah. for Mary. Is this on? Yeah. Oh. Speak. Oh, it's on. Um, felting is is the best fiber um, preventing felting in the washing. It should help. I'm running now felting tests and cushioning tests, and I mean I'm still until I get the the final product from John mm. to do the <laughs> testing. i have so far I've been just. You know, working our way through processing, and now it's to refine it to um, a place where that's been a consideration. I've done some blends with churro, and they're a more robust fiber, but the felting quality is, and uh, you know, it's too much felting, and and the bast in there will help with that. Mm. Thank you. And so in our, we're going to actually just have time for two more questions. I'm sorry we didn't get through all of them. But Sandy, I was hoping that you could help inspire this group to understand how many of you out here would actually be interested in growing flax in your garden? All right. <laughs> Wonderful. So do you have any tips for these gardeners um, uh, to be? Okay. Well, <laughs> flax grows really easily. It's an easy crop to grow, um, but you do want to grow it close together, especially for fiber, because the fiber wants to be tall. So the closer that you can get the planting. So the common way of doing it is just to hand broad, broadcast one direction and then go the opposite direction. So you have a good coverage within your um, little plot. Kind of a square plot's really good. So um, that would be my first suggestion. Um, and then try it as a winter crop. Hey, you know, plant it. I mean, you could get the, um, well, we're going to do some by the end of this month, early December. The other thing I'm going to say, it's going to probably be hard for you to find seed. Okay, that may sound good. Y'all want to do it. Um, there are a few sources, but when that, that uh, you can buy catalogs and find them, but once they're sold out, they're sold out. We're wanting to create a seed bank in Chico. So we are starting to get our seeds developed with the university's help. We can really go forward on that. Mm -hmm. So um, don't give up on it. I'd say, you know, when the catalogs come out, order your seed, because you're only going to get like 70 of them. But, you know, for the small garden, that's good. Push ours. Yes, we will. <laughs> In January. By January, I think we're going to have oh, yes, He's our seed man. I didn't want to get to that. <laughs> so you do have enough seed for a few people in the room? 300 kilos. 300 kilos. <laughs> well, it hasn't come yet. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds promising, though. That's good. That's why I brought him. <laughs> Thank you. And... Um, so then, if we were to have an ideal, Lydia, maybe you could wrap us up with, if all of the infrastructure were in place, and you could create your ideal blended yarn, hearing from Mary P and Mary W and Sandy and John about what's on the horizon, do you have any ideas or vision about what you'd like to create as someone who works with the textile construction component of this? Well, every single fiber here I've been listening to and thinking, well, I could do a tri-blend of the metal and the alpaca and the bast, or I could do, you know, a wool and a, a cotton and the cotton and hemp. And all of that is, I mean, it's viable. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, once again, from my perspective, is creating fiber, or not fibers, because you guys are the experts there, but creating yarns and textiles that will... Um, will be commercially viable for consumers to um, to look at and say, well, I can replace that 
hoodie or that fleece, that polyester fleece that I've been wearing forever mm -hmm. with one of these innovative uh, fiber blends because it looks and feels similar but better. And in fact, mm -hmm. I, I just wanted a little plug. I am um, in development with some um, commercially uh, commercial size printing of natural dyes. So Thank you. there's that as well. So there's and, and actually what I'm wearing right now. Um, we're working on um, piece dyeing uh, fabrics instead of vat dyeing. So instead of cuts of three yards or five yards of fabric, it's actually dyeing by the roll. It's it's a big deal to do in natural fibers and you know natural dyes, so natural chemistry. All of those are um, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. And then do we have like thirty seconds? So, John, what would you like from this group in terms of, does anyone out here do their own yarn construction? Do they send their product off to a mill and make their own yarn? How many of you do that? Are there people, okay, so in that group who, who are making their own yarn, are you looking for mill partnerships or yarn partnerships for early stage like, like Mary um, to help you innovate in that way? Yes, most definitely. Um, we actually, we have a sign-up sheet over there. If you're interested in, in getting fiber and developing a yarn, um, we can help with that. And one, we can provide the fiber. We can help help find mills that can potentially spin it. And uh, that's where we're at right now. Um, and we hope to be producing a lot of this fiber in the near future. So uh, please sign up if you're interested. And then Mary, you had one last word. For it. I've been working with I've been working with a mill in Arizona that Rob has been incredible. Mm -hmm. Working with John and I to we getting it to a place where he can mill lace weight singles and lace weight two ply with these hemp blends and he's been fabulous. He has a cotton card so he's able to process either cottonized hemp or uh, what do you call the other kind? The longer. Is it all cottonized? Yeah, semi worsted. And anyway, <laughs> he, can, he can do it all, and he's incredible. He's been kind of helping us since the get go. Hmm. So, getting the mills in the U.S. on board with blending would be a great way to kick this off. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. So, we are going to take, and get, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs>